Good evening. We meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Good evening, distinguished guests, your honours, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pip Nicholson, the new dean at the Melbourne Law School. I have been wondering at what point I stop announcing that I'm the new dean at the Melbourne Law School, but I don't think we're quite at that point yet. So it's a very great pleasure to welcome you all here for what I am absolutely confident is going to be a very enjoyable lecture. Tonight's event forms a part of the Sir George Turner Memorial Lecture Series, which is an annual lecture series established when Grace Melvin Turner bequeathed in her will of 1944 the establishment of a law lectureship in the memory of her father, Sir George Turner. I would now like to say a few words of introduction to Justice Susan Glazebrook before I invite her to deliver the lecture this evening. Justice Susan Glazebrook is a judge of the Supreme Court of New Zealand. She was appointed to that position in August of 2012 after serving two years on the High Court and 10 years on the Court of Appeal. Justice Glazebrook chaired the Institute of Judicial Studies from 2007 to 2012 and is currently a Vice President of the International Association of Women Judges. In 2014, she was made a Dame Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for service to the judiciary. Before her elevation to the bench, Justice Glazebrook was a partner in a commercial firm specialising, unsurprisingly, given the topic of tonight's lecture, in tax and finance. She has also served on a number of commercial boards, government advisory bodies, including in the taxation field. From 1990 to 95, Justice Glazebrook was a member of the Tax Education Office and the New Zealand Law Society Taxation Committee. She was a member of the New Zealand Committee of the International Fiscal Association from 1988 to 2000. In 1988, she was also president of the Inter-Pacific Bar Association. We are proud, grateful and delighted to welcome Justice Glazebrook, who has kindly agreed to give the Sir George Turner Lecture. And we look forward to you sharing with us your wealth of knowledge on charities, politics and tax. Let us relax and enjoy your unique insights, Justice Glazebrook. Thank you. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tato koto. I greet you in Te Reo Māori, the language of the Indigenous peoples of New Zealand, and in fact one of the three official languages of New Zealand, along with New Zealand Sign Language and English. Although it was pointed out the other day that English isn't actually on the list of official languages, and so perhaps there are only two. So I apologise uh, if, uh, well, to everybody if I am uh, speaking in English, which is an unofficial language, at least of New Zealand. Um, and I, like the Dean, pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which this event is taking place and acknowledge their elders past and present and any visiting elders there may be from other lands. It is an honour to be invited to give this a George Turner lecture and thank you for the kind introduction, Dean. It's particularly apt that this lecture, given in honour of Sir George, is one on politics, tax and charities, given Sir George's illustrious political career, both in Victoria, as I understand, the first um, Australian-born Premier, um, and also uh, federally as Treasurer. I thought I would start by contrasting two cases. The first concerned the establishment of a society for the prevention of cruelty to animals. In 1985, this was held to be charitable. The second related to an organisation dedicated to securing the release of prisoners of conscience and the eradication of torture. In 1982, this was held to be not charitable. So what was going on? Was this a strange variant of the idea that a gentleman may beat his wife but not his dog? Well, perhaps. 
But as well, the second organisation which you probably gathered was Amnesty International, fell foul of what I will call the political exception to the definition of charity. But in order to examine the exception, we must first start with the rule, in this case, the definition of charity. The modern definition of charity has its origins in the English Reformation and the gap left by the Catholic Church in terms of caring for the poor. In 1601, the Statute of Elizabeth was passed to create a structure to supervise charities, to help encourage private donation, and to prevent abuses that had arisen in the administration of some charities at the time. The statute's preamble provided a list of charitable purposes, including the unsurprising relief of aged, impotent and poor people, the maintenance of sick and maimed soldiers, and the marriage of poor maids. It also included various educational activities, and somewhat oddly to modern ears, the repair of bridges and highways. This preamble has had a major influence on the court's later attempts to define charity, which is of some significance for at least two reasons. The preamble was not, in fact, meant to be a definition at all, and the statute was obviously passed in very different times and for very different purposes, and this may explain some of the issues with the modern definitions of charity. The authoritative legal definition of charity was based on the pre preamble and was set out by Lord McNaughton and Pemsel in 1891. It was actually based on a formulation that had been given in an earlier case, but that's a bit more complication we don't need for this lecture. So Lord, Lord McNaughton said, charity, in its legal sense, comprises four principal divisions. Trust for the relief of poverty, trust for the development of education, trust for the advancement of religion, and trust for other purposes beneficial to the community, which didn't fall under any of the other heads. As Lord McNaughton noted, however, difficulties arise because the popular meanings of the words charity and charitable um, don't coincide with their legal meaning. I had my clerk do an informal survey of her colleagues at the court as to what they thought of as charitable. The common thread was that it involved giving altruistic assistance to those in need in a manner that was for the good of the community. So the answers effectively concentrated on the first and fourth limbs of the Penzl definition and the important value of altruism. But significantly for the next part of our discussion, they also concentrated on the altruistic giving of tangible benefits. Lord McMorton's formulation forms the basis of the statutory definitions of charity in Australia, New Zealand and England and Wales. In Canada, there's no legislative definition of charity, but in order to get fiscal relief, charities must register with the Charities Revenue Agency, or CRA, and that agency uses the Penville definition to determine charitable status. Of uh, the four heads of charity, it's usually the fourth head that gives the most trouble, as it is indeterminate and also has the added public benefit dimension. Further, it's not only the question of public benefit that's at issue. The earlier case law also required um, anything in that fourth head to be within what they called the spirit and intendment of the instances given in the Statute of Elizabeth, the 1601 statute, I remind you. But it was also recognised that the notion of what is in the public benefit can change as society itself changes. These two concepts sit rather uneasily together. The first one, it seems to me, is best described as seeking the vibe of the Statute of Elizabeth, stealing the famous line in the film, The Castle, for those who haven't seen it. The second is to a degree orthodox in terms of assuming statutes are always speaking and adapt to modern conditions. But it is, I think, difficult trying to work out how modern situations and views fit within the updated vibe of a statute passed in such very different times for very different purposes and which was not even intended as a definition. 
In most statutory definitions, apart from in England and Wales, the public benefit of the first three heads of charity is assumed, even though that was not necessarily the position at common law. In Australia, in England and Wales, there has been a legislative attempt to define more closely the types of entities and issues that potentially come within the fourth limb, but the public benefit must still be assessed, and this can place the courts in the delicate position of having to assess the merits of controversial matters to determine whether or not they are in the public interest. So now to the political exception. Neither the Statute of Elizabeth nor its preamble mention political activities, probably unsurprising given the date of its passage and the context in which it was passed. Although many of the modern cases say that charities have long been restricted in political activities, commentators suggest that this was not in fact the case and that the exception is a relatively late entry based on a text published in 1888 and the misinterpretation of earlier case law. As Chief Justice Elias said in the New Zealand Supreme Court of Greenpeace, the exception is in fact based on surprisingly little authority. It was Lord Parker's dicta in Bowman that's been treated as the origin of the restriction. Now this is particularly odd because Bowman was not in fact a case on charities at all. It concerned whether the gift of the remainder of a deceased estate to a society that discouraged belief in the supernatural was void. And it would have been void if promoting anti-Christian information had amounted to the offence of blasphemy. Uh, the majority held that it didn't, uh, basically as long as the views were expressed politely, that was fine. <laughs> Uh, in the course of the judgment, uh, Lord Parker discussed the dividing line between charitable and political trusts, the latter, he said, not being charitable. Uh, the political exception, um, starting in Bowman, was picked up over the years in cases in New Zealand and Canada, and uh, although I must say with a lot less enthusiasm in Australia. It's not um, the law in Scotland or the United States, and charities are free by lawful means to advocate for changes in legislation or policy in those jurisdictions. The exception in the US, at least, however, is that they mustn't directly promote the success of a political party. Um, Canada, after some years of difficulties over the issue, has codified the political exception, allowing charities to carry out a limited amount of non-partisan political activities in support of their charitable purposes. The current regulator guidance says that no more than 10% of resources can be spent on such activities and there must be reporting on the political activities carried out. And there was um, a major issue from 2012 where the regulator decided that they would audit charities in order to see whether that was being complied with. It in fact became an election issue and in 2017 that practice was finally stopped and there was a, a report on charities which indicated some um, possible modifications. Um, but I don't think um, that the government has yet said what it's going to do about that report. Um, just to complete that, there was a suggestion in New Zealand uh, that the uh, political exception had been codified, but as I discuss later, that was held not to have been so in the Greenpeace case. But what is political for the purposes of the political exception? My clerk's informal survey of her colleagues included a question on what they understood by that term. Interestingly, there was a split in answers. Around half of the um, participants talked about political being associated with government or trying to get into government. The other set of answers related to the wider concept of trying to influence the government's legislative programs or policies. For the purpose of the political exception, this wider view of politics is taken. And with some symmetry with the definition of charity, there are four heads of um, activities deemed political in the case law. The first is to further the aims of a recognised political party. Well, most of us would have no difficulty including this in the term politics. The second is to promote uh, the spread of a general political doctrine such as socialism. Again, most of us would have little difficulty with this coming within the definition of political activities. The third may be more problematic. 
is where uh, the entity seeks to persuade the public to adopt a particular attitude of mind towards some broad social question, such as community relations or peace. With this head too, there is a possible overlap with the education limit, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. However, it is important to recognise that the influence sought is on the public, not necessarily the government, although of course the government is of and for the people, and they must be hoping, at least in that sense, to influence the government too. So this can be seen as political in a broad sense. Like the definition of charity itself, it's the final category that raises the most issues. Politics includes any attempt to bring about or to oppose changes in the law, which usually also accompanies advocating for government policy changes, whether needing legislation or not. And there is an added issue of international comity, whether legislation or policy changes advocated for are to foreign law or policy. It was that last limb that tripped up Amnesty International in the case of McGovern against the Attorney General. The case concerned whether Amnesty could be registered as a charity in the United Kingdom. Amnesty's purposes, including looking after victims of torture, attempting to procure the release of political prisoners, undertaking research into the observance of human rights, and seeking the abolition of torture. It was the last of those objects that got into trouble. It was held that Amnesty could not be charitable, as one of its main objects was to change domestic or foreign legislation. This was political in nature, and it meant that Amnesty was not set up exclusively for charitable purposes being the requirement, despite its other three purposes being clearly charitable. Um, there had been an argument that the third research limb was not charitable, but the judge held that had it stood alone, he would not have denied um, amnesty charitable status because of the mere theoretical possibility that the research it was conducting could be used later for a political purpose. That, he said, didn't detract from the research clear public benefit of disseminating information. Um, the early cases do stress that it is political purposes rather than political activities that come within the exception although this was muddied slightly by saying that activities could be used to discern purpose in some circumstances. However, if an entity um, only engages in political activities, incidentally it was said, and for the attainment of a charitable purpose, then it will still be charitable. Now this distinction between purposes and activities requires the very unrealistic, in my view, assumption that political activity can exist independently of political purpose. One commentator has described the whole thing as arbitrary, as it focuses on how a charity presents its message, rather than the message itself. It must be said, however, that at least in the older cases, where one of the means of achieving a charitable purpose was legislative change, then it was very difficult to persuade a court that that purpose was subsidiary. And the amnesty case is really a good example of that. I do note that the law may have taken a different course if the minority had prevailed in the 1947 vivisection case that was decided some 34 years before McGovern. In vivisection, the majority of the House of Lords uh, held that a society established to stop vivisection came within the political exception. That's because its main purpose was advocating the repeal of legislation controlling vivisection and thus allowing it in some circumstances, and its replacement by legislation outlawing the practice altogether. The majority also held that the objects of the society were not in the public benefit, given the health benefits uh, that could arise from vivisection to both animals and humans, although I interpolate these health benefits did not arise for the poor vivisected animal. Had um, the minority view prevailed in that case, however, the judicial framework would no doubt have developed differently, with the amnesty case likely being decided the other way. As the dissenting judge, Lord Porter, saw it, the primary object of the society was the prevention of animal suffering caused by vivisection. 
Changing the law was an effective means um, to uh, abolishing that practice. But the abolition of vivisection could have been achieved without a change to the law if all members of the community could have been induced to stop those practices. Lord Porter said he was unable to accept the proposition that, for example, the anti-slavery campaign would have been charitable as long as its supporters did not advocate legislative change but became political as soon as they did. Lord Porter observed that to take such a view would, to me, be to neglect substance for form. As to the issue of public benefit, Lord Porter considered that charities for the protection of animals were within the class of objects considered charitable. Once that conclusion was reached, it was not for the courts to hear evidence as to whether the particular means of achieving the object was in fact beneficial. In the case at hand, therefore, it was not for the courts to hear evidence on and decide if the benefits of vivisection outweighed the suffering of animals it caused. Lord Porter did say, however, that if the means advocated for by the society had been a mere fad or against public policy, which nobody had suggested in that case, then the situation would have been different. I also think that it's possible the amnesty case may have been decided the other way, even by the majority of judges in the vivisection case. This is because those judges did conceive of situations where seeking legislative change could be a subsidiary or ancillary purpose not engaging the political exception. Lord Normand put this the most clearly when he said it was necessary to discover the general purposes of the entity and see if they are in the main charitable or in the main political, it all being a question of degree. In Anderson's case, it could well have been argued that its main purpose was the clearly charitable one of stopping torture and aiding torture victims by a number of means and not legislative change. Um, the political exception has led to what can appear arbitrary distinctions. I've already noted the one about cruelty to animals being charitable and cruelty to humans not being. Um, another example that has been pointed to is the case of um, Southwood, which held that it's charitable to educate towards the view that peace is preferable to war, um, contrasted uh, with the Anglo-Swedish society case, which held it was political to help two societies to find peaceful ways to live together and therefore not charitable. It seems to me that the reason the distinction can, be, can appear arbitrary might lie in the fact that although charities are private organisations, they work in the public sphere and must meet the public benefits test. The court's attempt to separate politics and charity despite their inherently intertwined nature uh, is problematical. The political purposes exception um, assumes that charities can be politically neutral entities. However, they're really inherently political in the sense that they reflect the social and economic uh, reality of the surrounding environment. One commentator argues that the purpose of philanthropic behaviour has traditionally been to influence the behaviour of the receiving class. This was particularly true of charities of the Tudor in the, in, in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Charity was given to people who, in the eyes of the providers, deserved it. And this meant uh, to those who were prepared to adopt the providers' <coughs> values, or at least pretend to. Even now, many charities are still designed to modify behaviour. I give, for example, budgeting charities and those dealing with drug and alcohol or problem gambling. Now, I'm of course not suggesting that entities performing those functions shouldn't be charitable, nor am I suggesting that their activities are anything other than worthy. Rather, this example highlights that charity can't be viewed in isolation and will often have a political undertone. Organisations that seek their, to uh, persuade their clients to modify their behaviour do so because they believe that this will be in the client's and the community's best interests. And these sort of activities fit well within the ordinary understanding of charity, which has the notion of altruism and of bodies that help people rather, tr rather than try and change the world. In modern times, however, as well as undertaking traditionally charitable activities, more entities are seeking to challenge and change the established order for the benefit of the vulnerable 
or for the benefit of the community as a whole. The view is that it is not individuals but society that needs to change. This is basically an attempt to tackle the cause and not just the symptoms of the problems they see. Such goals can be seen as more traditionally political or bear to spouse for altruistic reasons and within this, with the sincere belief that they will create a better society. And in fact they are often accompanied by scientific and empirical evidence to back up the claims. It is arguable, in fact, that the political purpose doctrine emerged as a response to the shift towards entities directing their attention away from the individual and turning it towards society as a whole. One commentator has said that there is a logical distinction between politics and charity, in that charity seeks changes in society, whereas politics uh, seeks changes of society. I agree this might be a way of articulating the, articulating the differences between the cases. It does, however, beg the question as to whether such a distinction should be made. So what is the rationale for the political exception? In Bowman, Lord Parker put it this way, a trust for the attainment of political objects has always been held invalid, of course that's probably not the case, not because it is illegal, for everyone is at liberty to advocate or promote by any lawful means a change in the law. But because the court has no means of judging whether a proposed change in the law will or will not be for the public benefit. Further justifications for the doctrine given in case law have been that the law could not stultify itself by holding that it was for the public benefit that the law should be changed. There is the related point that the courts should not usurp the functions of Parliament by deciding that proposed changes to the law would be in the public benefit. The cases have also addressed the difficulty of the situation where everyone can agree that an ultimate goal is worthy, but where the opinions on the means to achieve that goal are divided. In such cases, the courts have said it is impossible for them to assess the public benefit of the particular means advocated for. The cases have also addressed where the situation, um, the situation where the topic is highly controversial. In such cases, the concern is that the courts would be compromising their neutrality by picking one side over the other. The commentary on the cases, uh, rather than the cases themselves on the whole, addresses what we might think of as the elephant in the room with the final rationale that it is inappropriate for political organisations to benefit from the fiscal advantages given to charities. So let's have a look at all of these rationale more closely, starting with that given by Lord Parker in Bowman. Lord Parker has been criticised um, for his rationale. Remember he said that the courts have no means of judging proposed changes in the law. I think his main concern might have been to preserve the role of the courts as interpreters rather than evaluators of the law. But even if that's not the case, um, I consider the criticism may have been somewhat unfair. It is unlikely that charities advocating a change in the law would be advocating for technical changes to legislation, where indeed judges might have um, expertise. Charities would often be advocating for broader legislation with a high policy content, and there isn't indeed a question of institutional competence with such legislation. On the other hand, it is difficult to say how one could say that it's impossible for judges to assess whether or not legislation outlawing torture was in the public benefit or not. It is, after all, a pretty simple question, and one might have thought one with a pretty simple answer. So while institutional incompetence can provide a reason why the courts may not be able to assess public benefit in some cases, it doesn't justify a blanket ban on uh, ass them assessing whether a change in legislation would be for the public benefit in all cases. Uh, the idea that the courts do not have the ability to assess whether a proposed change of law would be for the public benefit in any event creates an inherent tension with the test for determining whether the, an entity is charitable. Under the PEMSL definition, the assessment of public benefit is an integral part of the definition of charity, at least for the fourth limb. 
the tension thus lies in the necessity for the courts to conduct a for the public benefit test in the first step of the inquiry when determining if an entity can be a charity, but pleading inability to conduct the same inquiry if there's an alleged political purpose. The next rationale is that the law should not stultify itself, which was a justification given by Lord Wright in vivisection. I find this one hard to understand. Seeing the law as immutable would be much more likely to stultify the law than admitting it might be in need of amendment. I think, though, that Lord Wright's concern was more that adjusted by, uh, more that articulated by Justice Dixon in the Royal North Shore Hospital case. He said. It is, of course, quite clear that any purpose which is contrary to the established policy of the law cannot be the subject of a good charitable trust. But there is a further consideration arising from the very nature of the doctrine by which charitable trusts are supported. Under all four heads of the well-known classification, an essential element is the real or imputed intention of contributing to the public welfare. A coherent system of law can scarcely admit, admit that objects which are inconsistent with its own provisions are for the public welfare. Now, while I can see an argument that a fundamental attack on the policy of the law could be a threat to the rule of law, it's very difficult, however, to see advocating for change of a particular part of the law to be a threat to the coherence of the law. This rationale could also potentially favour those advocating the status quo over those advocating for change. And of course, as recognised in case law, ad advocating for no change can be just as political as advocating for change. It also seems to me that it just cannot be assumed that the law as it stands is necessarily in the best interests of all of society. For, for example, in the past, it wasn't a criminal offence for a man to rape his wife. Marital rape was only made illegal in New Zealand in 1985 and in um, Australia um, at various times from the 1980s onwards. Further, until um, 1985 in New Zealand and up until the 1990s in some parts of Australia, gay men risked criminal prosecution for acts between consenting adults and private. Even now, there are disproportionate numbers of our indigenous peoples of both our countries in our prisons, which may not be an issue with the laws in themselves, but may, at least in part, relate to how those laws are administered. A related rationale for the exception uh, rests on the function of the courts being to apply the law and not usurp the function of Parliament by deciding that changes in the law are for the public benefit. This is essentially a strict adherence to the doctrine of the separation of powers, but it is not the reality. Courts do, quite properly and of their own motion often, suggest that matters could do with legislative attention. If they come across legislation that doesn't seem to be working as it intended, that doesn't cover a particular situation that has arisen, or that is simply unintelligible, which happens quite often. Courts may even quite properly suggest that legislation is required to deal with situations where the common laws become confused or out of date, or where new situations have arisen which would benefit from legislative regulation. Further, as one commentator has put it, the rationale does seem to rest on what Lord Reid called the fairy tale, that judges never make the law but only declare it. And more importantly, allowing an entity advocating a change in the law um, charitable status doesn't in fact change the law, that is the function of Parliament, which is perfectly entitled to take a different view on public benefit. Suggesting a law change therefore just can't affect parliamentary sovereignty. I do accept that international comity issues can arise where entities seek changes to foreign laws and policies. As charities receive fiscal advantages, they cannot really be seen as purely private entities divorced from the home state. I don't think, however, that advocating legislative policy change to foreign governments can be seen as objectionable, where what is advocated for accords with international norms, including international human rights norms. The prohibition of torture, which was at issue in the amnesty case, is in any event a peremptory norm of international law or use Kogan's, so it's not even dependent on treaty obligations. In any event, um, even with fiscal advantages, charity, charitable entities are still separate from the home state and can't be equated with it. 
I said I'd come back later to the distinction between education and politics. This is particularly relevant for entities that come within the third limb of advocating for what all can agree is a worthy end, but with a particular viewpoint as to how that aim can be achieved. It seems to be the case that advocating for a worthy end cause could be classed as education, as long as there is some objective justification for the view outlined, and both sides of any credible debate on the issue is covered. If the debate is one-sided, then it is seen as political. Another way of looking at it was the way Lord Porter did in the vivisection case. If the ultimate goal is charitable and for the public benefit, uh, then debate on the means to best achieve the purpose can be beneficial in itself. Um, that's a slight extension of his view on the last part I'm interpolating there, for a, a bit from the age of what case it must be said. Um, but if this approach were adopted, there'd be no need for the courts to adjudicate on the um, uh, merits of a particular means, which will always be a difficult task. It usually involves value judgments the courts may not be in the best position to make. The only thing they're adjudicating on is whether the ultimate end goal uh, fits within the statute of Elizabeth intendment. As to entities advocating positions on inherently controversial issues, and particularly those that involve, to any extent, competing moral arguments, the courts have definitely been reluctant to confer charitable status. And I think that really is to avoid appearing to take sides on the issue and thus compromise their neutrality. And I think this is understandable. So that if the requirement was to look at the underlying merit of the particular position advocated for and decide if that was in the public interest, then there really is a legitimate concern that courts would be called upon to make inappropriate value judgments, which might be a, 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 an argument for using the, the, the Lord Porter issue. As one commentator has noted, um, the courts currently get around this issue by using um, neutral reference, reference which he describes as um, independent points of evidence, allowing a decision maker um, to decide public benefit is uh, present without having to form a, a view on the underlying moral judgment. So this means that a court would not decide something is in the public interest without being able to point to objective facts or figures. On the other hand, there is a danger of classifying something as a political problem simply because our society may be divided about it. As another commentator has pointed out, religion can raise strong opinions and would not necessarily have neutral references one can easily point to, but it has been accepted as being charitable. So I think this is why a totally different way of considering this issue has been proposed by some commentators. Um, and it is um, effectively that um, the court should not be called upon to adjudicate on the ultimate position or means advocated for and effectively be forced to choose one side of the debate in controversial matters. It's argued that especially for controversial issues, it can be the debate in itself that's for the public benefit and that the political exception attempts to stop a private entity from becoming involved in public issues. And this sits uneasily, they say, with the notion of freedom of speech. Democratic debate is normally presumed to be beneficial to the community, the notion being of the marketplace of ideas, that, I, that views will compete against each other with the correct view prevailing. The political exception, it has said, adopts the opposite presumption. Now this brings us to my elephant in the room, um, the fiscal benefits of being a charity. Now there are other benefits of being a charity, but it is generally accepted that fiscal benefits are the most important, and this is understandable because it affects the financial base of the charity. A strong argument in favour of at least some form of political exception is that taxpayer money should not subsidise political speech, at least in the uncontrolled manner it would if all political entities could register as charities. The US, in fact, while allowing entities with political purposes to be charitable, excludes them from the uh, associated fiscal benefits, where a substantial part of their activities are political. As pointed out by uh, Professor uh, O'Connell and her colleagues in their article, however, Scotland and the Council of Europe take a different view. 
Uh, the argument um, is that while tax, uh, refusing tax relief um, doesn't in itself stop freedom of speech, it does mean that only those who can afford to speak out do. Charities represent the marginalised and disadvantaged members of society. Often these are the individuals who are most in need of representation. Charities which do attempt to get the state to address key issues in their field uh, risk being labels as political and lo losing their charitable status. This can have a chilling effect on their willingness to speak out on issues affecting their clientele. Losing charitable status would affect their financial base and creates the contradiction that entities which, which are established for the purpose of permanently solving a charitable issue can be deemed to have political non-charitable purposes and therefore not being charities with the state effectively rewarding those who only address symptoms and not the cause of societal problems. So Amnesty, for example, was told, by all means, look after torture victims, but whatever you do, don't go into advocating for legislation that may in fact be a vital step towards eliminating torture and therefore eliminating the need for your services. It's certainly arguable that um, if charities are stopped from engaging politically under a blanket ban on political purposes, then that does pose a risk to a healthy democracy. Charities, of course, can offer unique perspectives from a range of sectors, from environmental through to social welfare. Um, and again, as uh, Professor O'Connell and her colleagues put it, advocacy and political engagement are better conceptualised as an essential and perhaps the most effective method of achieving charitable purposes. The political purposes doctrine is also difficult to reconcile with other heads of charity, such as religion. Under the political purposes rule, uh, regardless of whether the purpose can be argued to be objectively beneficial beneficial. If it is a significant political purpose, then the entity is not charitable. Yet, um, under most of our systems, religious trusts are automatically charitable, despite the fact that they are often advocating for one view of religion, however outside the mainstream and however individually based. It's a case in England uh, where a woman uh, was spreading her own writings on Christianity, and she was found to be advancing religion despite her writings being described by the court as incoherent and confused. Religious trusts devoted to spreading and sustaining their own version of religion are arguably analogous to political purpose trusts in the manner that they operate. Both put forward particular perspectives, and religious entities are not required to present more than one side of the debate. Now, I'm not suggesting there should be any curb in um, freedom of religion, uh, but some have questioned whether taxpayer money should be available for spreading and sustaining particular religious beliefs with what, without the same consideration of public benefit as required under the fourth limb. Now, these issues, of course, do not arise uh, with regard to religious entities providing the traditional tangible assistance to the vulnerable. And, in fact, um, it must be said that... Um, at least in New Zealand, um, our system of government and social welfare couldn't survive without those entities and the services they provide. Um, my analysis of the political exception and the justifications for it shows, I think, um, that a blanket political exception has both conceptual and practical problems. On the other hand, I think it also shows that there are justifications for some form of political exception, even if we don't call it that. At the least, I think, um, no one would doubt that political parties, however necessary in our form of democracy, don't fit within the normal, uh, normal view of what is charitable. And the courts have um, decided uh, that those sort of arguments are actually right and that there isn't as much justification for the um, political exception that has had been thought in the past. So I now turn to the two modern cases, one in Australia and one in New Zealand, that have dealt with that. Um, the Aid Watch decision by your High Court was the first instance of a higher appellate court rejecting the political purpose doctrine, at least to the extent it created a blanket prohibition on political trusts being held not to be charitable. Uh, the High Court considered whether any entity could claim charitable status when its purpose was to engage in public debate 
in order to influence the actions of the state. In a majority decision, the court found that lawful generation of public debate can be beneficial and thus charitable. Um, AidWatch was um, an organisation concerned with promoting the effectiveness of Australia's aid programmes and it had a particular view as to how those aid programmes um, should be delivered, concentrating on particular um, in relation to the um, communities themselves, uh, women in those communities and environmental issues. Um, in AidWatch, the submission of the Commissioner had been that a subsidy by the state through the fiscal advantages accorded to a charitable body was inappropriate where, as in this case, uh, the activities of the entity were political, it said. Uh, the majority of the High Court um, looked at this uh, in accordance with the common law definition of charity because at that stage there wasn't a detailed uh, statutory definition. Um, the majority said uh, that the position of Lord Parker and Bowman had not been wholeheartedly accepted in Australia and that the case had not been decided in the context of Australia's constitutional arrangements. Uh, and it said, in particular, under the Australian Constitution, communications between electors and legislators and the executive and between electors themselves on matters of government and politics is an indispensable incident of the Constitution. So it therefore assumes the legitimacy of agitation for legislative and political change and that this contributes to the public welfare and that a court is not required to adjudicate on the actual merits of the position advocated for. It's the expression of sharing views in themselves that can satisfy the element of public benefit. So the majority accepted the submission of Aid Watch that the generation of public debate on the best methods for the relief of poverty in itself came within the fourth category of PEMSOR. Um, that the activities of AidWatch, however, related to the first limb, the relief of poverty, even if not coming within it, was, however, important for the decision. The majority kept the ratio of its decision narrow and simply decided that debate as to the efficiency of foreign aid for the relief of poverty satisfied PEMSOR didn't find it necessary to decide whether generating public debate on matters outside the first three categories would meet the public benefit test on its own, or whether for some further public benefit would need to be shown. It also didn't um, consider other forms of political activity other than public debate. And it also left open the possibility whether public debate on purposes that might appear to fall within one of the four heads in PEMSOR nevertheless don't contribute to the public benefit because of the particular ends and means involved. The majority made it clear, however, that there is no blanket ban on political activities um, in Australia. It's also worth discussing briefly the dissenting judgments of Justices Kiefel and Hayden. Justice Hayden, I think, effectively took uh, re the relatively old-fashioned view that the, um, as Professor O'Connell and her colleagues have pointed out, with a conception of charities as those providing tangible benefits. Uh, so needless to say, he thought that pressing a particular point of view without tangible benefit was not charitable. Um, Justice um, Kiefel, as she then was, uh, was also apprehensive about opening the door to allowing public debate being deemed charitable per se. She did, however, accept that what's regarded as a charity may develop or change according to the needs of society, but there must be a public benefit to, that, to the public in that. And she also accepted that advocacy in itself could, in some circumstances, be charitable. I've noted the time, so I'm just skipping through a bit, um, bit more quickly on that. Um, but having examined both the stated purposes and the way in which AidWatch operated, she uh, considered that it wasn't possible um, to accept AidWatch's view that their way would make aid more effective. And she noted that AidWatch was not attempting to generate debate, but was intent on having its views accepted. And it's 
pursuit of the freedom to express its views did not achieve the requisite public benefit. The next decision I'll discuss is that in Greenpeace. Um, this was a decision of the Supreme Court of New Zealand, my court, and although it has similarities to Age Watch, the reasoning was different, at least um, from that of the majority of Age Watch, um, but actually very similar to the views expressed by Justice Kiefel. Now, in part, this difference results from the different constitutional arrangements. New Zealand has no overriding written constitution, although there are parts of the constitution that is written, and it has a Bill of Rights which includes the freedom of expression rights. There were two issues in Greenpeace. One was whether illegal purposes made a, a charity not able to be, an entity not able to be charitable, and uh, the Supreme Court held unanimously that that's the case. If you had illegal purposes, you could not be charitable. And the second was the political exception. The court, by majority, held that the political exception would no longer automatically disqualify charities in New Zealand. Um, and the difference. Um, between the majority and the minority rested to a degree on the legislation in New Zealand, uh, which the majority held did not actually create a political exception in New Zealand. So in Greece, the majority didn't consider there was justification for maintaining a blanket ban. Um, it said that political purposes and charitable purposes were not mutually exclusive. And it said it was difficult to justify a total ban on the promotion of legislation when such advocacy may in some cases constitute in itself a public good, analogous to other good works within the sense the law considers charitable. Um, further, it thought that a strict exclusion uh, risked raising rigidity in an area of law that requires flexibility and has been flexible in order to be responsive to how society works. And it was recognised that advocacy for human rights or the environment could in itself come to be regarded as charitable, depending upon the nature of the advocacy, and even if it wasn't ancillary to more tangible acts of charity. However, the majority did note that advocacy of causes um, will often not be charitable, and again, this is because of the difficulty of assessing the public benefit of the views advocated for. So, um, just to let you know the aftermath of all of that, um, about a week ago, the Charities Registration Board declined Greenpeace charitable status. The board um, viewed Greenpeace's purposes as being to promote its own views on the environment, peace, nuclear disarmament and weapons of mass, mass destruction, and that this was not for the public benefit in a manner accepted as charitable by the courts. The board also considered that Greenpeace had been involved in illegal activities and had a, an illegal purpose that would disqualify it from being registered as a charity. Now, as the matter might come before the courts again, it is inappropriate for me to comment on that decision. But I can make some general comments about where we've got to to finish. The first point is that in Australia, the majority decision in Aid Watch emphasised the constitutional value of free political speech. And that means even one-sided views will be for the public benefit, as long as they relate to the first three heads of the pencil definition. It was not necessary for the majority to decide, and was not decided, if this extends to the fourth head. This means that uncertainty remains. The next point is that the New Zealand position aligned more closely with that of Justice Kiefel. This means that while there's no longer a political exception in New Zealand, the activity must be for the public good, and within the spirit and intendment of the Statute of Elizabeth. And not only are the purposes looked at, but also the means and activities um, in order to assess this. Pure advocacy could meet that test, but it will be more difficult to do so if uh, what are seen as one-sided views are being put forward. Now, I think there's an argument that this, put this puts burdens on advocacy charities that are not present for charities providing more tangible benefits. So charities providing tangible benefits are not required to prove the public benefit or efficacy of their services in order to retain charitable service status. Indeed, I suspect there are a number of charities providing services that are not in line with modern evidence as to what is most effective. 
There could also be an argument that the courts, at least in New Zealand, have not totally caught up with the shift in many charities from treating symptoms to addressing cause and um, the need uh, for the vulnerable to be represented in that debate by organisations which work, work with them and are best qualified to assist in giving them a voice. So I look forward to our discussion, even though I know we've gone slightly over what I said I'd speak to. Thank you very much, Susan. I know we've run over time, but I am just going to take a couple of questions, so um, if there are any. Um, Matthew. Thank you very much indeed for a very thought-provoking talk. Um, you suggested at times, I thought, that um, fiscal considerations should come into play when we're thinking through what the legal definition of charity should be, and that's um, a proposition that courts in different jurisdictions at different times have formed different views on. Um, I just wondered if, if you could give us some further thoughts on that. Um, do you think it would be beneficial for um, the legal definition of charity for tax purposes uh, to um, be allowed to drift away from the legal definition of charity for, say, the purposes of the law of trusts, um, as indeed we could say is happening in Australia at the moment um, through various um, means. I, I suppose um, in some ways the um, definition of charities um, has exactly the same problems as the definition of income and income tax in that they are actually taken from um, from things that actually have nothing whatsoever to do with what they are now being forced to do. Uh, and so that's one of the difficulties, I think, with um, with the whole idea of of, of, um, of charity being based on a definition that was there in 1601. Um, I suppose one of the issues of um, divorcing the definition of charity for tax purposes is that the people looking at it for tax purposes may not have a full understanding of what charities do in society and that it may not be and so what, what you would land up with was a definition that says you can do what you like on this side and being very restrictive on the other side. So if, if that was going to happen, and there are certainly arguments for it, I think, uh, then it would need to be very carefully managed because I can just imagine a situation where you can land up with, with, a, with a terribly restrictive definition of charity on one side, uh, which will usually be the one relating to money, which um, may not serve the interests of society. And I suppose the, the difficulty that we're, we're facing um, is really starkly there with the pure advocacy charities. Uh, but of course, the, the difficulty that's faced with the pure advocacy charities means it puts a chill on those charities that are not purely advocacy, but, but in fact need to advocate uh, for particular things in order to fulfil their, their more wider aims in terms of the tangible benefits they provide. Or indeed want to get rid of having to provide those, charitable, uh, those tangible benefits like in the amnesty case. Um, my name's Anne O'Connell. Um, I invited um, Justice Glazebrook to give this lecture um, in part because she was a member of the majority of the Supreme Court in the Greenpeace case. And so I'm delighted that she was able to um, speak to that tonight. Um, but also because um, in her life before becoming a judge, uh, she was a tax lawyer. So um, clearly understands the fiscal implications of uh, charitable status. Um, although after nearly 20 years as a judge uh, on generalist courts, perhaps um, the notion of being a tax lawyer has been pushed further, um, further back. Um, I also note that um, Justice Glazebrook has spoken on many issues, um, including human rights, criminal justice, immigration and gender equality, as well as um, uh, on a range of tax uh, matters. Um, I'd also just like to observe that um, 
uh, New Zealand is um, sometimes being described uh, in Australia as, as lapping Australia. Uh, not only do you have a popular female Prime Minister, um, <laughs> but a majority of Supreme Court judges, including the Chief Justice, are female. Um, and although we can boast a um, female Chief Justice, we're, we're not quite at the majority stage. Um, just in terms of what you spoke to us about tonight, um, as Matthew said, it was wide-ranging and extremely um, thought-provoking. And it made me realise that despite these two very important cases that have been heard now by our highest courts, um, matters related to charities and politics um, are still highly contentious. Um, both countries have some legislation that seeks to deal um, with what charities can and cannot do, um, but we are daily faced with issues about whether charities are overstepping the line. Uh, in that context, it's um, my great pleasure to thank you for not only um, delivering a lecture, but coming all the way from New Zealand to do so. Um, I have some uh, deep affection for the fact that this is the Sir George Turner lecture. My first appointment at this university was a three-year lectureship as the Sir George Turner lecture, lecturer. Um, and I just note that my um, salary for three years has now been condensed into one night of thought-provoking discussion. <laughs> and I think that we're all better off for that. <laughs> so, um, so I thank you and I would ask you to join with me in thanking Her Honour in the usual way. Thank you.